Uh, Your Honour, this is the closing argument on behalf of Ivan Chermak. <clears throat> At a stage in the case, it having started in March 2008 with the opening of the prosecution, the calling of witnesses, and then a considerable period of time later, the closing arguments to be presented. And we're able to look back through the corridor of that time and take an assessment of what was said the day Mr. Teeger opened the case, what had been written in an indictment before the opening of the case, what had been written in a pre-trial brief by the prosecution, the allegations that they were to make, and we look back now to see whether they have been proved or not. What has changed? Whether there's been any substance to support those allegations. At the start of the trial, they were relying upon statements taken in the English language, Croatian witnesses not having statements in their own language, witnesses who had made statements subsequently came into court and were accountable in a trial for what they had said and an examination of what they had said to investigators took place and during that period of time there were some telling moments uh, I'm just going to identify four because they concern the Chermak case and they were telling moments that show that the case that was to be presented was not the case that came about in fact and they showed a prosecution that was on the run with its allegations. It had started with broad allegations of General Chermak being in command of umpteen divisions of the split military district. It had started with allegations of him being in command and control of everything that moved in and around Kinin and Sector South. Is that where they have come to that, that same position where Mr. Carrier addressed you yesterday? Did he have that convincing confidence about a man who proved his case? Looking at the final brief, when you read it, analyze the allegations that have been made, look at the footnotes, not ours, but look at the prosecution footnotes and see what is cited in support. Are those citations correct? Reflect what, is, what has been written in the main document or false? And I'll use that word because that's a word that came up in the prosecution final brief about evidence from the Chermak defense. It's not a word I would generally use in court, but it was one we took exception to in the final brief from the prosecutor. And we heard it again yesterday. But let no one doubt we will meet fire with fire. But those telling moments, let's just have a look at those. When General Lausic was to give evidence before this court, the night before he met the prosecution investigator. He was furtively handed a brown envelope. I don't know whether it was furtive or not, but it sounded like it from his description. And in that envelope were documents. 
And one of those documents was the Exhibit D34, the Organisational Order of 1993 concerning garrisons. This was a document that had not been mentioned by Mr. Lausich in his considerable interviews as a suspect with the prosecutor, not been mentioned in his statement that had been prepared from those interviews by the prosecutor, and suddenly someone in the prosecution team must have thought, we've dropped a clangor here. We have made a big error in our assessment of what is relevant in the evidence in this case. Because Lausitsch's failure to address the key document concerning the authority and powers of the garrison commander was missing, it wasn't referred to, and it was significant that the prosecution expert, Turnans, had only mentioned that document in one page of his voluminous expert report. That was a telling moment of a prosecutor on the run trying somehow to get a, an advantage from an important witness in relation to an important exhibit. Another telling moment, the second I will refer to in relation to another key witness. For this, the Gotovina team will take credit, and that's why I gave them the extra five minutes. They wanted Mr. Turnan's draft of his reports. It was not something that we were interested in. We were content to contest Mr. Turnan's on the report we had before us. But that was instructive, because that draft report, two weeks before it was finalized, showed such substantial and substantive changes concerning the case involving Mr. Chermak that his whole position in this trial had to be rewritten by the prosecution expert to support the constructed indictment against Mr. Chermak. We spent a few days finding out about the drafts. We spent a few days analyzing the drafts, but the product of it we are grateful for because in our view it was a telling moment. The next telling moment was when Mr. Jolich came to give evidence. He'd been the commander of the Kinin Company of the Military Police for one week in Kinin. When you look at his statement, it's very curiously written, as we've set out in our final brief, to establish some kind of authority or that he was expected to obey orders from General Chermak to try and make some kind of command connection. You look at the paragraph concern, number 34, and you can see it's entirely unconvincing as the sort of document this court has to rely upon. But when he came to give evidence and had to be accountable for what he had said, he resiled from what he had said to the prosecution and he presented an entirely different picture of the evidence, a telling moment. The same telling moment came about with the witness P86. Exactly the same issues and exactly the same matter arose. Outside the comfort of the statements that had been taken years before, 
and when made accountable in court, those witnesses did not provide evidence upon which the prosecution had tried to establish the foundation of their case against Mr. Chermak.